Hi folks, and welcome to Open Analysis Live. So today, what is a breakpoint? I'm sure most of you are probably using breakpoints every day while you're debugging malware, but have you ever wondered what is it? What is happening under the hood with your debugger when you set a breakpoint? Well, stick around and we will explain it. But before we do, just a quick shill for our Patreon. The clip that you're about to see comes from one of the tutorials we released on Patreon. It's a seven part series on building a debugger from scratch. We build it in Python and give you all the details on what's happening under the hood while you're building it. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, I encourage you to go check it out. Hope to see you there. Without Without further ado, let's get on with it. Now first, what is a software breakpoint? Well, a software breakpoint is actually an instruction which is interpreted by the CPU and triggers an int3 interrupt. When that interrupt is triggered in the Windows kernel, it's converted into an exception debug event with a type of exception breakpoint. What's fundamentally important about a software breakpoint is the fact that it must actually be written into the code of the target process before it executes. It's literally changing the code of the target process. Now, the way this works in practice is when you set a breakpoint, the debugger will read a byte out where you want to set the breakpoint and store that in its own memory in a breakpoint table. Then it will overwrite that byte with the CC opcode, which is the int3 uh, or breakpoint opcode, and then it will continue execution of the target process. Then when the CPU interprets that CC, it raises an int3 and the exception breakpoint is raised to the debugger. The debugger then looks in its breakpoint table and it sees that this is a breakpoint that it's set. So then it raises that as a breakpoint to the user and whatever needs to happen happens. But then when it wants to go back to executing the code, it needs to do a few things. The first thing it does is it restores that saved byte that it has in its own breakpoint table back into the target process. Then the debugger must move the instruction pointer backwards by one step and then resume execution of the target so that that original code is then executed. It's very complex and just describing that process might be triggering some alarm bells in your mind if you're thinking about how anti-debugging detection works and you're literally changing the code that's being executed in the memory of the target process. This is a very noisy thing to do. It's very easy to detect. And this is one of the drawbacks of software breakpoints. It's very noisy, you're modifying the code. Of course, the target process can modify the code back. It can check to see whether it's modified. There are many, many drawbacks to software breakpoints. However, they're very easy to set. You can set as many as you want, there's no limitation. And the whole process is pretty easy once you've coded it all up. What is a hardware breakpoint? Well, it's very different from a software breakpoint. A hardware breakpoint is actually an address that is set in a register on the CPU. And when the CPU reads or writes or executes code at that address, it will raise an interrupt. So that's the way a hardware breakpoint works. It's actually done by the CPU and it's set in registers in the CPU. Now there are four registers, DR0 to DR3, that can be used for setting breakpoints. These registers contain the address of the breakpoint. So with hardware breakpoints, you're limited to four. Now, though you're limited, hardware breakpoints are very powerful. They can be set regardless of whether the memory at the address of the breakpoint has been populated or not. It's simply an address that you set in the CPU. It doesn't matter whether it's a valid memory address or not. It's just an address that you're setting in the CPU that you're telling the CPU to look for when it's executing, reading, and writing. Hardware breakpoints are also flexible in that they can be set either to trigger on a write, a read or write, or an execution. So we have much more flexibility in how the breakpoint can be triggered. Also, just by their nature, hardware breakpoints don't modify the target, so they're a little bit stealthier. Obviously, the target can still interrogate the CPU to see whether these registers have been set, but it's not the same as actually modifying the target code. It's a little bit stealthier. Now, we've already talked about how the address for the breakpoint is set, but how is the breakpoint itself controlled? It's controlled in a register DR7 using a set of flags, and the flags will control information about how each breakpoint is set and how it's triggered. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but it's important to keep in mind that when you're talking about debug registers, you have DR0, 1, 2, 3, and 7. Those are the registers you need for hardware breakpoints. 
Okay, let's dive into these registers and how they're laid out. So DR0 to 3 contain the address of the breakpoint. These are stored in the little endian. It's very straightforward. It's just a register with an address. DR7, however, is quite complex. The DR7 register is used to control the DR0 to DR3 registers, and it is actually set via a bit mask. Now, it's divided out into a bunch of different areas with the least significant eight bits used as a bit mask to enable or disable the DR0 to DR3 registers as local or global breakpoints. Now, the way this works is if the least significant bit for the two bytes corresponding to the register is set, then it's enabled as a local breakpoint. If the most significant bit is set, then it's enabled as a global breakpoint. Now, there are no global mm. breakpoints on Windows. It doesn't work that way. So you're only ever going to be setting the local breakpoint bit for registers that you're using for hardware breakpoints. The most significant 16 bits of the DR7 register are used in a bit mask to determine the type of breakpoint, so how the breakpoint will trigger, and the size of the breakpoint pointed to by the DR0 to 3 registers. So this is set up in a block of four bytes where the least significant two bits are gonna tell you what type of breakpoint it is, so what's gonna trigger it, where the pattern here can be applied. All zeros is execute, zero one is write, and one one is read write or any access. Then the most significant two bits are going to tell you the breakpoint size. So zero zero for one byte, zero one for two bytes, one zero for eight bytes, and one one for four bytes. Those two are mixed around because originally there was only a maximum of four bytes for 30 bit registers. So the one zero was unused. Then when 64 bit registers were introduced, they added the eight bytes in. So that's why it looks like that. The breakpoint size is also important. For read and write, you can specify any length of that address up to four bytes or up to eight bytes for 64 bits that can be read or written to that will trigger the breakpoint. However, for execute, you must specify a single byte. You can't specify two or, or eight bytes or anything like that. So if you're gonna set a hardware breakpoint for execute, then you would be setting a bit mask for execute and one byte. That's the way it works. I hope you enjoyed that. And like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, there's more of that on our Patreon. If you enjoy this kind of stuff, go check it out. Hopefully we see you there. And remember, keep exposing the canvas behind the malware. Stay curious, guys.